Hello world, Joshua here at JTC Education and today we're going to be looking at one of the most important ubiquitous areas of maths that there is. You might love them, you might hate them, but you certainly can't escape them. It's quadratic equations. So first and foremost, we need to ask ourselves what a quadratic equation is. A quadratic equation is simply a polynomial of order two. And a polynomial is an equation with an unknown raised to different powers. For example, here I have a polynomial. There's x, my unknown, and it's raised to different powers. And order 2 means that the highest power to which it is raised is 2. In other words, a quadratic equation is an equation with an x squared in it, and it doesn't have anything larger than x squared, like x cubed, x to the 4, x to the 5, etc. Therefore, this is a quadratic equation. Now, you might look at this one here and be a little less certain. It doesn't seem quite so obvious straight away that it's a quadratic equation, but of course, if I expand out these brackets here, which I will do over here, I get 2x squared minus 2x equals 2x plus 7. It immediately becomes apparent that this 2 is a quadratic equation because the highest power of x is x squared. And finally, that brings us to this one here. This is what I like to call a hidden quadratic equation. Quadratic equations can be hidden in many, many different forms, but this is one of the most common ones. And at first glance, once again, doesn't really look like a quadratic, but let's not forget, if I times through both sides of the equation by x, which of course is absolutely fine in maths, then I will get this. And therefore, this also is a quadratic equation. So do keep your eyes peeled for these hidden quadratic equations. They don't come up too much at GCSE level, but they are an absolute favorite at A level and they do trip a lot of people up. Okay, so now let's look at the three most useful forms in which quadratic equations can typically come. The first most useful form is ax squared plus bx plus c. Obviously, it's important that we understand that a, b, and c are simply constants here. For example, it could be something like 5x squared plus 6x plus 7. a, b, and c are simply numbers. Why is this form so useful? Well, if this were equal to y and I wanted to plot the graph, then if I set x equal to 0, I can immediately see that my y-intercept will be c, because if x is 0, this is 0, 0, and y simply equals c. Remember, to find y-intercepts, this is always true, you set x equal to 0. The other reason why it could be useful, this first form here, is I can use it in the quadratic equation to solve for my roots. Remember, roots of a quadratic equation are when I set the equation equal to zero, so rather than y here, zero, and I try and solve as such. So that's form one. Form number two, I like to call the factorized form. And the factorized form is very useful for finding the roots even quicker. If, for example, this equals zero, I can very quickly conclude that there is the product of three numbers here, a, x minus p, and x minus q, and if a product of three numbers equals zero, one of those numbers must be zero. So either a could be zero, but a is a number and either it is or it isn't. Let's say for now that it isn't. x minus p could be zero. Very good. So x minus p equals zero, in which case I get that x equals p. And that is one root to my equation. Or x minus q is zero. x minus q equals zero, and I get x equals q. So having the quadratic equation in this form is very, very useful because I can very quickly read off my roots, p and q. And now the final form, which I like to call the complete the square form. Okay, if you've learned complete the square at GCSE level or above, you should know how to go from this form to this form. In any case, we're going to do it in just a second. Why is this form useful? Well, once again, if I want to plot a graph, so if I set this equal to y, I can immediately read off the vertex, that is the maximum or minimum point of my graph. How can I do that? Well, this is a square number. Therefore, it has to be positive, and therefore the lowest it can be is zero. So the smallest this can be is zero. When is this zero? Well, this is zero when x is h. Fine, so let me let x equal h. So when x is h, this is a minimum, it is zero, and therefore y, if this is zero, is simply equal to k. And because we agreed that this was the minimum value it could take, 0, I can be certain that k is the minimum value that y can take, and hence by having it in this form, I can be certain that h, k is my vertex. 
Okay, so now we need to check that we can definitely get between all of the forms. So let's start off going from form one to form two. Here is an example quadratic equation on the board. It is in form one, ax squared plus bx plus c, and I'm gonna try and write it in form two, which is my factorized form. The method is as follows. I like to draw a little cross here, and I like to take the product of a and c. This is a and this is c. So 6 times 15 is 90, and over here I will put b, which is minus 19. And I am looking for two numbers which add to give me this, and which times to give me this. If you're struggling to think of those two numbers, I have a recommendation for you. Simply think of your factor pairs of 90. So for example, 1 and 90, no, there's no way they can combine to give me minus 19. 2 and 45, etc, etc, etc it will quickly become apparent that 9 and 10 are what we're looking for. And to get minus 19, they need to be minus 9 and minus 10. Indeed, minus 9 times minus 10 gives me 90. Minus 9 plus minus 10 gives me my minus 19. OK, so why did we go through all that rigmarole? Well, we went through that to be able to write minus 19x as minus 9x minus 10x. And I know that's, of course, fine because I've just verified that minus 9 plus minus 10 gives me minus 19. So let's do that. 6x squared. Instead of minus 19x, I'm going to write minus 9x minus 10x plus 15. I split this into two halves and I'm going to try and factorize as fully as I can each half. So the biggest factor I can pull out of 6x squared of 9x is... 3x, and I would be left inside with 2x minus 3. And over here, I could think about pulling out a minus 5x, or excuse me, a minus 5, or I could pull out a plus 5. Let, let's pull out a plus 5 now for the sake of argument, and I'll be left inside with minus 2x plus 3. And we quickly see that these two brackets do not match up, and therefore I realize that actually I should have pulled out a minus 5. So just understand that when it comes to pulling out the factor on the second bracket, you could be correct to within a plus or minus sign, but you just edit it accordingly. So minus 5 comes out here. This is now plus 2x minus 3, and this is excellent news because these two brackets match up as they should. And because they match up, I can simply say, well, I've got 3x lots of 2x minus 3, so 3x, and I've got minus 5 lots of 2x minus 3, so minus 5. I can put these guys into their own bracket. And over here, I've got my 2x minus 3, and bingo, I am in the factorized form. Now, if you're paying attention, you might look at this and say, well, that's not quite the same as this form. And I agree, it's not quite the same because I have numbers in front of my x's. But it's a stone, th it's a stone throw away. I can pull out the 3 here of this bracket. I can leave myself with a minus 5 over 3 here. That's the same thing as that bracket here. Pull out a 2 here, and I'll be left with a minus 3 over 2 here. Let me shrink this all down to make a little bit of space. There we go. And so finally, I can simply change around the order in which everything is multiplied. I can do my 3 times 2 first. It gives me 6. x minus 5 over 3. x minus 3 over 2. That is the fully factorized form. In A level and IB, they do tend to ask for it in this form. In GCSE, you're going to be absolutely fine leaving it like such. Regardless, they're the same thing. So we have done form 1 to form 2. Brilliant. So now let us have a little look at how to go from form 1 again, but this time to form 3, the complete the square form. So basically, I'm going to teach you how to complete the square here. Well, the first thing I need to do when I am completing the square is I need to make sure that I have just a 1 in front of the x squared. So I'm going to factor out a whole 6. I'm going to use big square brackets here. When I pull out a 6 from here, I get minus 19 over 6x, and here I'm left with plus 15 over 6. And now I am able to complete the square. Very simply, what I do is I take half of this number here, so that would be minus 19 over 12, the way I did that so quickly in my head is I know if I half a number, then I need to make the denominator twice as big. I stick a squared here. I need to take off this 19 over 12 squared because if we think about it carefully, when I expand these brackets, I will get x squared, which I of course wanted. I will get two lots of x times minus 19 over 12, which gives me minus 19 over 6x. So I also wanted that. However, I will also be picking up the square of this term, which is very simply 19 
over 12 squared. Remember, it doesn't matter that it's minus here because if I'm squaring it, it will always be positive. Therefore, I would like to take away that extra 19 over 12 squared term that I picked up and then I very simply add my 15 over 6. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Let me just delete this part on here. Let me close that big square bracket. Very good. Now I'm going to use the calculator to add these two numbers together. So I have minus 19 over 12 squared plus 15 over 6. That gives me minus 1 over 1, 4, 4, 6. I've still got my big square bracket, x minus 19 over 12 squared. That's where I'm up to so far. And then finally what I do is I re-expand this 6. So I get 6 lots of x minus 19 over 12 squared. And then I get minus 6 over 144. That's my 6 times minus 1 over 144. So let me do that. Times 6 minus 1 over 24. And bingo, this is in the third form, which is complete the square form. And it's really, really easy for me from this form to read off the vertex, which would be 19 over 12 and minus 1 over 24. Just a quick reminder, if I flick back, if we look over here, h, k is the vertex. And here my h is 19 over 12, my k is minus 1 over 24. So that's form 1 to form 3. Now, of course, for completion, I should verify that I know how to get back to form 1. But that's really, really easy. If I come over here and I copy in my answer to this, how can I go back to form 1? It's as easy as expanding the brackets, right? So 3x times 2x gives me 6x squared. I've got 3x times minus 3 is minus 9x. Minus 5 times 2x is minus 10x. Minus 3 times minus 5 is plus 15. And bingo, I am back into form 1. So that's a piece of cake. And it's exactly the same if I take this here and copy it over to complete the square form. How do I go back to form 1? I literally just expand out the brackets and I will get back there. I'm not going to do that right now because it's a bit tedious, but if I expand the brackets, I'm back here. Expand the brackets and collect the, collect the light terms, that is. Brill. Great, so let's stick with the same quadratic equation and let's see if we can find the roots to this equation. Remember, roots are when we set the equation equal to zero and we solve for the unknown. Now, if I have it in this first form here, the most sensible way to do this is to use the quadratic equation. Remember, this is a, b is minus 19 in its entirety, and c is plus 15. And if I stick those values in here, I have minus, minus 19, watch out for that, it's minus b, plus or minus root minus 19 squared minus 4 times my a, which is 6, times my c, which is 15, bring that square root over everything, and divide by 2a. 2 times 6. And when you solve this on the calculator, my recommendation is for you to put it in exactly as you see here. And that way, you risk making zero mistakes. Now, of course, your calculator doesn't have a plus minus button. So the one thing that you do have to do is you have to do that separately. First of all, you do it with a plus and then you do it with a minus. Everyone have a go at that now. And so I've stuck it in my calculator exactly like it's written in the page. And when I let this be a plus, I got that x is equal to 5 over 3. When I let it be a minus, I got, let me go and stick that minus in right now, I got x equals 3 over 2. And therefore, these are my roots to this quadratic equation. And so finally, what about if I would like to use the complete the square form to find my roots. Remember I've set it equal to zero again, but this time I'm going to rewind back and find where I completed the square, which was down here. This was the completed square version. Let me copy it over. Here we go. So remember 6x squared minus 19x plus 15 is this once I've completed the square. I set that equal to zero and now I need to solve for x. So let's take the 1 over 24 to the other side. 6x minus 19 over 12 squared. Let me divide through by 6. So 1 over 24 divided by 6 gives me 1 over 1, 4, 4. And I'm left with x minus 19 over 12 squared here. And now I need to square root. Do not forget when we square root, we must pick up a plus and minus. I see a lot of people forgetting this, both at GCC and at A level. 
So I get plus minus the square root of 1 over 144. Well, I could just apply thirds here. It's square root of 1 over 144. The square root of 1 is simply 1, and the square root of 144 is 12. So I get this, plus or minus 1 over 12. And finally, I add 19 over 12 to the other side, and I land up here. And so finally, let me evaluate that expression using the plus. So that gives me 19 over 12 plus 1 over 12, which is 20 over 12, and 20 over 12 cancels down to 5 over 3. And secondly, let me do it with the minus. I get 19 over 12 minus 1 over 12. They're already the same denominator, so easy peasy. Gives me 18 over 12, which cancels down to 3 over 2. And bingo, I've got my two roots, 5 over 3, 3 over 2. They agree perfectly with the roots I got by the factorizing method, and of course also with the roots that I got by the quadratic equation. So that's a very quick overview of how quadratic equations work. The most important thing is that you remember that there are three useful forms that you can transform between all three of those forms, and if need be, you can find the roots, i.e. when the quadratic equation equals zero, using all three of those forms. Okay, great. So that leads us really neatly onto quadratic inequalities. So the difference between an inequality and an equation is in an equation, I had it was equal to something, and in an inequality, I will have that it was either greater than or equal, less than or equal to some number. In this case, I'm going to write zero, but if it hadn't been zero here, I could have easily rearranged this inequality to make one of the sides zero. And the goal of the quadratic inequality is to be able to sketch this graph. If I can sketch the graph, then I can simply identify where is this graph bigger than or equal to zero. Well, to sketch the graph, we could use the factorized form from before, 3x minus 5, 2x minus 3, that's useful because from here I can find my roots, in other words, my x-axis intersect. So let me have a go at drawing this graph. And let me note, as I draw this graph, there is a positive constant in front of x squared, therefore it's going to be a smiley face quadratic, and it's going to pass at the points x equals 5 over 3 and x equals 3 over 2. We saw that already, so 5 over 3, 3 over 2, it's a smiley face quadratic graph. If I did care, this y-intercept is going to be 15, as we discussed before, but it's not really important to this question. And I look at this graph, and I simply want to find where is it bigger than or equal to 0. It is bigger than or equal to 0 over here and over here. This is where the graph is above the x-axis, bigger than or equal to 0. So for which values of x is this satisfied? Well, when x is bigger than or equal to 5 over 3, and when x is less than or equal to 3 over 2. And therefore my final answer for the quadratic inequality is x is bigger than or equal to 5 over 3, x is less than or equal to 3 over 2. Notice how I have had to write this inequality as two separate inequalities. It is not okay to write the following. x is bigger than or equal to 5 over 3, and less than or equal to 3 over 2. That doesn't make sense because, of course, there is no number that is simultaneously less than or equal to 3 over 2 and bigger than or equal to 5 over 3. So I must split it into two inequalities or I am incorrect. However, had this question been a less than or equal to 0 here, then I would have been looking for the part that was below the axis, and in that case, it would have been absolutely fine to write that as one inequality because it indeed is one line on the graph. And I could have simply written between 5 over 3 and 3 over 2. That's if it had been less than or equal to 0 here. So that's how we solve our quadratic inequalities. Ever wondered where the quadratic equation comes from? Well, now I'm about to show you. This is a kind of bonus proof, both for GCSE and A-level. It's not a requirement. However, it's an excellent exercise in algebra. You must start from here, and you need to slowly show that therefore x is equal to the quadratic formula. And the way in which you must do this is you must solve this equation by completing the square in exactly the same way that you would do it if there were numbers, and I showed you before, except now there are simply letters. Now, I don't want to steal all the fun, so everybody have a go at this by themselves first, pausing the video in 3, 2, 1, now. Okay, so let's have a little look at the solution. 
So the first thing I notice that I can do is I can factor out an a. Remember, I do not complete the square unless there is a 1 in front of my x squared. Now, I could factor out the a, but actually because there's an equal 0 on this side, I can just divide 3 by a. So I divide both sides of the equation 3 by a, and I land up here. Then the next step in completing the square is to form that famous bracket where I put half of this number in the bracket. Half of b over a is b over 2a. I just need to make the denominator twice as large. Then I stick my square here, and remember I must take off that number squared, and I still have my plus c over a, and I am still equal to 0. So I've shrunk that down, and my next step is to make x the subject of this equation. So I'm going to add these terms to the right-hand side and I'm going to get b over 2a squared minus c over a, and here I'm just left with my x plus b over 2a squared. Now I'm going to expand this squared here to get b squared over 4a squared minus c over a, and I'm going to try and add these fractions algebraically. The way in which I add fractions algebraically is exactly the same way I add fractions numerically. I need to make the denominator the same, and I'm going to do that by timesing the top and bottom of this fraction by 4a over 4a. That gives me b squared over 4a squared minus 4ac over 4a squared. Great, so I've shrunk that down again and I can easily add these fractions now as they have the same denominator. And I can square root both sides. Remember this side was still equal to x plus b over 2a squared, so let me square root both sides. So I just have an x plus b over 2a here now, and here I will square root, and I must not forget that I pick up a plus minus when I square root. So now I'm just a stone's throw away from isolating x. I simply need to take away b over 2a on both sides, and I am left with x equals minus b over 2a plus or minus root b squared minus 4ac over 4a squared. Can you spot the closing step? Closing step requires me just to use my knowledge of thirds to split the square root over this fraction, so I can simply write this as plus or minus the numerator, b squared minus 4ac, and if I split it and just square root the denominator, I will get a 2a. I've still got my minus b over 2a here, x equals, and this is incredibly convenient because these fractions are with the same denominator already, so I can add them directly, and hey presto, I arrive at my quadratic formula. It's as simple as completing the square algebraically. Okay GCSE students, you're done for the day. From here on out, it's A-level and IB students only. Okay A-level and IB students, that brings us on to the discriminant, which is this expression under the square root of the quadratic formula. And it is incredibly important because it tells me how many roots how many solutions to this equation I will have. Indeed, we should know already that we can't square root a negative number and get real answers. So if b squared minus 4ac, my discriminant, is less than 0, that will simply mean that there are no real roots. Because if I were to put that in this formula, I simply don't get any real answers. And graphically, that's going to look something like the following. If it's a positive x squared graph, then it will look something like this, and the important thing is that it does not intersect the x-axis, and if it's a negative x squared graph, it's going to look something like this. Once again, not intersecting the x-axis because there are no real roots. And so the second case that we can see is when b squared minus 4ac equals 0. Now in this case, there's no problem to square root 0, it is just 0. However, of course, we're only going to get one real root, and that is going to be minus b over 2a. So this is the case of, we can call it a repeated root, a single real root, there's various different ways we can say it, but the point is, graphically, this graph will be just touching the x-axis because there is only one root to the equation. And so lastly, I arrive at the case of b squared minus 4ac is bigger than zero. We've seen this case since GCSE. That's not a problem to square root a positive number. I am going to get two real roots this time, minus b over 2a plus or minus the square root of this discriminant. So that's two real roots. And so graphically, these graphs are going to look something like the following. If it's a positive x squared graph, something like this, the key point being that it does intersect the x-axis in two places. And if it's a negative x squared graph, it could look a little bit 
like this. Okie dokie, A-level students, just one final thing to show you all. Earlier we saw that we could find the vertex by completing the square. I'm back at my example quadratic equation here. But let's see another way in which I can find the vertex. Of course the vertex is the maximum or minimum point, and I can find that by differentiation. So if I do dy by dx on this, I get 12x minus 19. Remember, I set that equal to 0 because by definition, a maximum or a minimum point on any function must have gradient 0. And remember, dy by dx is my gradient of the tangent at that point. So I set it equal to 0 and I simply find that x equals 19 over 12 which is in complete accordance with what I found before for x as my vertex. And I can very simply sub in this x equals 19 over 12 back into my original equation to get my y. So I do 6, 19 over 12 squared minus 19, 19 over 12 plus 15. Sub that into my calculator. And indeed, I get minus 1 over 24, which makes perfect sense because that is what the y coordinates should have been for the vertex. And therefore, via differentiation, I can equally well find that my vertex is 19 over 12 minus 1 over 24. And so let me just show that completely generally now. In this case, for y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, if I differentiate, I do dy by dx, I pull down the power to get 2ax. The a just sits there, it's a constant plus b, set it equal to 0, I now solve for x and I get x equals minus b over 2a and that makes brilliant sense. Indeed if I draw myself a sketch of a generic quadratic graph again we can see that the vertex of that graph sits bang in the middle of it, that is what we call the axis of symmetry of the quadratic function, all quadratic functions are symmetrical and it makes perfect sense if I look at the quadratic formula too because my roots are centered at minus b over 2a, this axis of symmetry, but they are plus the square root of the discriminant and minus the square root of the discriminant and that's what gets me my roots. So quadratic equations really are a cool topic in maths. As with anything in maths, there are many, many different ways of looking at them and understanding them. Algebraically, graphically, but whichever way you choose to look at them, the key thing is that you have a deep understanding of them. And as such, you'll be able to problem solve and tackle any quadratic equation that Cut. comes up in an exam. So don't forget folks, it's hip to be squared. Joshua here at JTC Education, signing out.